Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan, and today I'm going to be presenting to you some of the work that we have been conducting here in the uh, Center for Long CC Buybacks. And as Bruce and Zach mentioned before, this is a partnership work that we have been conducting with the people from um, the Curtin Corrosion Center. Um, so the title of my talk is How to Particle Cross Interactions with Protective um, Corrosion Scales. So the main conclusions that I want to walk you through after showing you the work that we have been done um, is related to the protectiveness of the scale that forms, especially in sweet corrosion scenarios, and um, the effect that the that these scales um, have on cyclopentane hydroparticles that we from the lab. Um, uh, so, as just walking through, through the conclusions, um, we're going to show you that the protectiveness of this scale is quite high for general corrosion rates. So, they reduce corrosion rates by 84%. However, this is just one type of corrosion. Um, so, these scales are still prone to um, another type of corrosion, which is called pitting corrosion. Um, when these scales come into contact with cyclopentane hydroparticles, um, we notice um, that they enhance hydro growth and they form um, our hydroparticles. Um, and we want to relate this to the change in surface roughness that increased by a factor of two when we corrode these um, carbon steel samples. And we notice as well an increase in the addition for again by a factor of two for short contact times. But then for prolonged heavy contact time, we observe um, significant increase, a 30 fold increase uh, between hydro wall addition force and um, these um, corroded scales. So the main motivation of um, conducting this work is that we notice um, uh, an outstanding knowledge gap between uh, pretty much how um, flow assurance engineers address um, different problems like hybrid scientists usually address corrosion in a very basic way compared to how material engineers address corrosion issues. And from the kind of like corrosion side, pretty much um, pipe integrity engineers kind of like they don't even care about like hydrates that much. So um, the whole point was to kind of like, well, they coexist, especially in this scenario, where we're going to have hydrates flowing into our pipelines. Um, so how we can connect these existing practices and technologies to kind of like bridge these two sciences together and especially to like um, uh, laboratory conditions, how the current state of research um, uh, it studies hydrates and it studies corrosion and how we can link that together. So the main point is like interlinking the um, system specific interfacial interactions for um, these two uh, phenomena. We also notice um, a limitation in experiments um, with real what material engineers call real steel at conditions, especially for internal corrosion um, scenarios. So the whole point um, of the project is pretty much uh, how we can um, go through the whole life cycle of the hybrids in um, corroded pipelines. So for the hybrid point of view, we're going to focus on the agglomeration stage, hydro formation, and um, for the corroded environment, we wanted to focus on um, the CO2 um, kind of like sweet corrosion issue. We know that this is a, a common um, byproduct of contamination of the gas produced here in Australian prominent fields. We know also from theory that when we have CO2 and water present, we're going to form a byproduct that is iron carbonate, um, pretty much um, spontaneous precipitation um, due to the um, conditions for um, this um, kind of like uh, environment. And we know also that um, when we have this byproduct present, um, usually material engineers kind of like take this into an advantage to protect um, for further corrosion of the bare metal. When this um, kind of like mineral is then sparked, it can be protected if we control the pH of the environment. So from the whole um, kind of like apparatus that we have in the center, um, the main one that we used was the micromechanical force apparatus. Um, this um, kind of like apparatus, one of the advantages that it allows to form um, hydrates at ambient um, pressure conditions when we use cyclopentane as a hydro um, former. And the methodology for running these addition and cohesion um, measurements has been um, quite used in the past decade by a methodology that was developed by TAC. Um, we also, uh, from this list, we're going to use, I'm going to show you some results from um, Raman spectroscopy as well. And um, from, um, because this is a partnership work, so we wanted to go and do like cutting edge kind of like measurements related to corrosion. So. Um, we use the um, Curtin Corrosion Center Laboratories. Um, they have a vast 
um, kind of like range of potential start and electrochemical space that allows us to uh, run um, really accurate electrochemical uh, measurements to pretty much measure the corrosion rates uh, of our carbon steel samples. So coming into the methodology of how we can quantify addition and cohesion force at the lab by the use of um, the micromechanical force apparatus, um, it's pretty much by applying Hooke's law. And um, the way that this methodology works is that we use an atomizer to place um, small, tiny um, DI water droplet at the end of a carbon fiber um, film. Then we attach that film to a glass cantilever and we connect that to a micro manipulator um, on the lab. Um, we have two of these uh, micro manipulators. The static one uh, usually will place the hydrate. And then the moving one, if we want to measure addition force, then uh, we place a substrate or a steel particle. If we want to measure cohesion force, we just attach uh, another same diameter um, um, hydro particle. So after we have a DI water droplet uh, at the end of the carbon fiber, we quench that into liquid nitrogen for about 30 seconds. And then we move it quickly into an aluminum cell containing liquid cyclopentin. We control the temperature um, by a glycol cooling jacket. We run these measurements at 3.2 degrees Celsius. Um, and pretty much the methodology that we apply, we apply from moving top kind of like cantilever a preload force that we calculated before into our, um, a stationary or static um, cyclopentane particle. We wait for 10 seconds contact time, then we separate at a constant velocity from the top um, cantilever. We measure that distance and separation distance. We multiply that by the spring constant of the carbon fiber. And that's how we calculate, um, in this case, addition force. We do this 40 times, uh, 40 trials. This is an um, a stochastic kind of like approach. It's not a deterministic one. So the values that we report uh, we reported with 95% confidence in survival. And um, the first thing that we uh, kind of like did to validate this methodology was um, using a pristine um, corroder resistant allo that was, was provided by the people from um, the Curtin Laboratories. Um, so on the video I'm showing you is pretty much how the methodology work. So you have, um, uh, in this case, CRI sample. We apply a preload force um, for 10 seconds, and then we separate at a constant velocity. And at that uh, separation um, point, we measure the distance, and that's how we calculate each of these uh, individual data points. So we do that four times to measure um, um, for an independent measurement. And on this graph, what I'm showing you is how we benchmark um, the result from this pristine CRA sample with a baseline um, that we find in literature developed by SAC with stainless steel. So what we notice is that um, slightly decreased of 0.2 um, uh, millinewton per meter for this uh, particular sample. So we ended up having an um, addition force of 0.59 millinewton per meter. So now I'm gonna move a bit of like fundamentals of CO2 corrosion. And coming back to what I was saying before, um, the way that usually hydrate um, uh, researchers approach the corrosion issue is quite basic. Um, so we noticed from literature that the approach that they use is pretty much immersion of steel coupons into a uh, brine solution or acidic solution. Some experiments they even use put, um, they sometimes put the steel coupons into acid uh, solution like hydrochloric acid. And this is kind of like what they look, um, what we know of corrosion with this kind of like orange um, color. Um, the thing is, like, this is not a real scenario for corrosion, especially if you want to um, kind of like evaluate internal corrosion in uh, subsea tiebacks. So in this case, the main cathodic reaction is the reduction of oxygen. That's why you're going to have those hydroxides over here. Um, the thing is, like, when you have um, uh, oxygen inside, um, reacting in, um, near the surface of your steel samples, then um, you're going to form um, iron tree um, species which is what we usually known as rust. This is just iron oxide. Um, the thing is like when we're trying to simulate an um, internal corrosion scenario, this is a common pitfall uh, for CO2 experiments. So we don't want um, like a reactant cell to look like this. That's just um, uh, not good for us. And if we're operating like a usual, um, like a normal um, subsea pipeline, we, we're assuming that we're not gonna have oxygen inside. So that's not gonna be uh, a problem for us. So. In reality, CO2 corrosion is a bit more complex um, than just that. So this is the main reaction um, that will scan kind of like that process. When we have iron, CO2, and water, then we're going to have iron ions, carbon ions, and hydrogen. And we need to focus here on two different scenarios of um, kind of like 
our pipeline. So the first one is the reactions happening in the water, which um, the main reaction is going to be the carbonic dissociation. So we have CO2, water, the CO2 is going to dissolve and it's going to form a carbonic acid. That carbonic acid is going to dissociate and that's going to bring us pretty much the carbonate ions. Then later on, close to the steel surface, um, when the electrochemical reactions start happening, then we're going to have the anodic dissolution of iron. This is how pretty much um, the degradation of our steel is driven. And then we're going to have the um, cathodic reactions, the cathodic species that are going to be the ones kind of like taking out the electrons of the steel. And the main reaction over here um, is the reduction of this carbonic acid that we form into the water. So when we have high concentrations of um, iron ions, our carbonate ions, close to the surface of our steel, we're going to precipitate a solid um, um, iron carbonate scale, right? So the way that we can simulate this kind of like complex process in the lab is by using a tree electro reactor. Um, and pretty much the whole point of, um, of the tree electro is to we need to build a small closed circuit that is going to allow us to measure the changing voltage um, um, due to like this oxy, like redox reactions happening near the steel sample. So our working electrode is going to be our steel coupon. Um, we use a reference electrode of silver silver chloride um, in a KCL solution um, and a counter electrode we use um, graphite cell. So once we close the circuit with a counter electrode, then we can apply um, electrochemical measurements pretty much to measure um, corrosion rates based on penetration rates. Other of the uh, features that we have in a reactor, so we have a CO2 in the flow, we're bubbling um, constant CO2 into a reaction, into a reactor cell. We have a pH uh, meter probe because we're measuring in situ pH. Uh, we work with high temperatures, so we need a, a thermocouple. We use a buffer solution to control the pH and a magnetic stir. So, um, the main material of our coupons is carbon steel grade X65, which is the most common kind of like material for um, subsea um, type of pipes. Um, and that's a working electrode. Our electrolyte is a one way percent solution of uh, sodium chloride. We work at high temperatures, and this is mainly to accelerate the kinetics of um, our electrochemical reactions and to form our scale quite fast. And we use uh, one molar sodium carbonate as a buffer to control on the pH. So at high alkaline pH, around um, 7.8 um, uh, pH, um, the precipitation of uh, this scale is going to occur faster. So after running the, the electrochemical um, experiments, this is pretty much um, the results that we obtain. So on the y-axis here, we have um, the potential. And then on the right-hand axis over here, we have um, the corrosion rate on the red point. And this is just against um, our time. Um, so I was saying to you before, uh, we measure the corrosion rate by penetration rate, um, relating the current flow with the mass via uh, Faraday's law. And um, the main key here for the potential, um, um, so think of the potential as the characteristic of metal to lose electrons. So it's kind of like a measurement of how um, fast um, our metal is degradating, right? So between the 10 and 20 hours of experiment is where uh, pretty much the main thing happened. We saw an increase in the potential from um, 200 millivolts, and at the same time, a decrease in the corrosion rate um, by 84%. So the increase in the potential, pretty much what is given us, is an indication of the retardation of the anodic dissolution of the iron. And um, this is something that we can explain by the formation of a scale. So once we form a scale, that scale is going to act as a, a mass transfer barrier. So it's going to prevent the hydrogen cathodic species to like keep degrading of bare metal, right? So this is pretty much how this scale looks when we took um, same images. So they're cubic kind of like cream shape um, uh, crystals of iron carbonate. And we assume that they form uniform along our um, specimen or steel um, sample, then it's going to be protected, right? Preventing further um, cathodic species to grow it. And then now that I'm going to move into cross interactions with cyclopentane hydrates, um, this is just so, as a reference, this is pretty much the area that um, our hydrate is going to be, cyclopentane hydrate is going to be contacting for our um, carbon steel samples. So the first thing that we observed when we, when we took those samples out of the reaction, of course, didn't bring it here to the center and run um, MMF experiments, was a change in the hydrate morphology uh, and evolution after the contact point. So uh, just on the image first, um, this was before um, uh, contact teams for the first time on the first trial. 
And then this is just the evolution of how the hydrate uh, changes in morphology after uh, five minutes of just one um, trial. So uh, on the video, this is pretty much how it looks. And the contact point uh, over here, then um, what we think is happening is that the hydrate, the hydrate shell um, breaks up to the contact point. And then this kind of like, um, at this point, what we're seeing is just unconverted water inside a hydrate particle that is escaping and forming um, additional hydrate. Um, so we notice an increase in the additional force by a factor of two. I call it observable because we were not able to run um, 40 uh, full trials due to the change in the morphology. So for applying um, uh, pretty much the model to measure, um, hoops law to measure um, that addition force, it was not going to be that representative. Um, then we move into kind of like changing um, contact time, uh, right? So we went to five, 10, 60 seconds, and then uh, five minutes. Um, and what we noticed was an increase um, in the addition force as well for um, short contact times. Um, again, the same phenomenon happened. And so the shell was breaking at the top of um, a cyclopentane high particle um, for this uh, substrate. And um, again, like the, the data that I'm reporting here is just uh, after 10 full of trials due to the same phenomenon of um, high breaking. Um, but the uh, quite interesting bit is what happened for prolonged contact times. And this is just um, video of like um, those experiments at five minutes contact time and how um, um, the change in the morphology of the hydra was happening even when when was in contact. So what we're seeing here is all the kind of like water inside a particle kind of like escaping at the contact point and forming um, um, just at the uh, interface of this um, iron carbonate um, sample. So after um, having kind of like this um, um, results, we want to move into kind of like evaluate both chemical and mechanical effects, pretty much focusing on um, our um, scale sample and um, try to explain what was happening that it was causing that effect on our habits. So we pretty much run advanced microscopy experiments to kind of like um, have this issue. And um, the first thing that I want you to focus on of is um, the change in the steel surface roughness, right? So we apply two different techniques. Um, these images here um, were uh, obtained by using optical profilometer. So they give us a measurement of the change in surface roughness linearly. And then um, this is just a video of um, how we can get to the same um, increase by, sub by a factor of two of surface roughness by using different techniques. So we use an atomic form microscope um, to obtain those results. And we kind of like came to the same conclusion. So the surface roughness increased by a factor of two if we compare the pristine sample over here with the um, um, iron carbonate um, sample, right? So this is kind of like a profile of how it looks with high peaks and low valleys. Then we went to run some Raman spectra, and this was we want to focus in on um, like the chemical composition of our scale. Even though we know that from theory is iron carbonate, we just wanted to um, confirm. So um, on these images, um, we run the Raman spectra pretty much at the center of it. So for um, the right hand side one, we focus on uh, a pretty flat, smooth kind of like crystal. And um, what we observe after running um, Raman and compare the spectra, pretty much we did uh, review is that um, this peak is related to the formation of iron carbonate. What um, engineer materi um, um, material engineers uh, call um, cedarite. Then we move to a different spot in the same sample that was not as smooth, kind of like in the middle again. And what we noticed was a similar peak, not quite the same. Um, um, and then again, moving into kind of like a loop review uh, of what this spectra means. We find out that this is a new kind of like mineral. It was discovered in um, uh, 2008. It's called chicanerite, uh, right? And then um, what we discover is that this kind of like the formation of the mineral in a scale is related to the evolution of how the scale forms. So from here we come to the um, to the point of like this is an sporadic, um, a spontaneous uh, reaction. So um, the um, the cubics that the scale is going to form um, spontaneously, but um, after this um, um, report um, that was um, carried out in the uh, University of Manchester, what they actually discover is that the formation of the scale is kind of like an evolution process. When first you're going to have uh, kind of like a, a, 
a play um, of this chicanoblade material. And when you increase the time uh, on your experiments, then you're going to have a well fully developed um, kind of like a scale that is going to be protected, right? So this was the first indication that um, even though after 82 hours of the experiments that we run, um, the scale was not fully um, developed. And then we want to focus on kind of like more irregularities that we find in our, um, our sample uh, to kind of like confirm um, this finding. And um, so the first thing that we notice is that um, some what we call we can call impurities um, in our sample. So after running same images and EDS, we found out, for example, that this um, kind of like solid on the top of our sample was related to silicon. So that may be possible contamination to kind of like taking the sample out of the cooking laboratories and bringing it up here, just dust pretty much. And then um, definitely some confirmation of um, the different spots where the scale was not fully developed. Uh, uh, as you can see on the right hand side image, Again, there's an evidence of um, um, bare metal and um, chicanoid present. So this is a high kind of like a warning um, from the corrosion point of view of like how this scale is not fully formed. So it's a high risk for um, extreme localized corrosion, which is going to give us um, extreme uh, rates of um, corrosion rate, right? And then um, finally, we did some elemental analysis. So this is a different technique. It's called EDS mapping. Um, when uh, I just want to focus here on kind of like the, the um, black dots on the sample right here. Um, so after running um, EDS mapping, um, pretty much what this technique gives us is um, kind of like a bright in color of um, elemental uh, materials. So for this uh, picture right here, this is carbon. So when you have this kind of like bright red um, colors on those dots, meaning that um, the technique is identifying elemental carbon at those spots. And then we went to run some um, iron. Uh, what we see in the picture is like um, the majority of the pink is the formation of the iron, um, of the iron carbonate scale. But then on this, um, if you superpose kind of like the iron and the uh, carbon images, then you can notice that when there is not iron, but it is carbon, then you're going to have um, these kind of like holes of a bare metal, right? So um, this is pretty much critical for um, risk of extreme corrosion due to um, the habitat species kind of like attacking these particular points, uh, um, and, you know, it's having like um, corrosion. So coming back to uh, the cross interactions and how we can relate this to um, uh, high particles, well, we know that for high uh, prolonged times, um, there is um, kind of like a significant increase in the adhesion force to which extent this um, kind of like effect can um, increase the, um, the um, pitting corrosion effect by removing the scale layer, something that um, we need to take into consideration. So again, to the conclusions, um, we notice how this uh, protective scale, we conclude how this protective scale reduced general corrosion rate um, by 84%. But how um, this is still prone to um, pitting corrosion, extreme localized corrosion. How we conclude as well how this um, iron carbon acid scale increase and roughness by a factor of two, and how this may be related to uh, the enhanced of hydrogrow and particle deformation. How um, these scales increase the addition force by a factor of two for short contact times and for prolonged contact times when we have a terrible increase in uh, this force. So part of the future work that we want to do um, after moving into the next stage is, well, the people in um, Curtin Corrosion Center have um, one of the few laboratories in the world that you can work with H2S um, for moving into um, more sour corrosion environments, right? And then kind of like measure the effect. Uh, and these environments at different uh, scales gonna form with different morphology. So I want to measure how um, that change in the chemistry of that um, scale and the morphology could affect our cyclopane and hydro particles. Um, then we want to bring um, FFCIs into the picture and uh, kind of like evaluate if this, the addition of the FFCIs is going to prevent um, the cyclopane particle to break after contact with um, corroded um, surfaces. And then finally, we want to go to an early stage of um, the hydro life cycle and evaluate the effect of this corrosion scale in the um, high dimension stage. So yeah, thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge um, Professor Sackham and, and Professor Mariano Yanuzzi from the Curtin Corrosion Center. 
um, um, as well as Dr. Busnaris and Dr. Juan Ki for the um, Raman um, measurements. Thank you.